Tevat is stuck in a samsara. We are reliving a time loop. Are two of the oldest theories in the lore community, but they are neither the same nor are they mutually exclusive. And now, finally, one of them is basically confirmed while the other is heavily implied. And in the process, we learned exactly why the descenders are so important and how they are linked to the samsara. I'm talking about this particular text, of course. It tells us that the Narcissan Cross Ordo believes that people go through four samsara cycles Hyperborea, Atlantean, Ramuria, and Kron Arya, being that the latter corresponds only to the first half of the fourth cycle. According to them, this samsara is entirely about spiritual refinement and evolution. But we are not just speaking about esotericism here. These cycles are very much real and they apply to all of Tevat. The Prayer's Artifact sets told us like a bajillion years ago that eternity is cyclical. Everything comes to an end, but that's not the end of the story. Because every single time a cycle ends, the world is made anew. So that means that Tevat has been remade a total of three times and we are now living in the fourth cycle, right? Nope. This is exactly why I made a distinction between a samsara and a time loop. So let's very briefly explore the meaning of samsara in Buddhism. I promise this is relevant. Buddhists believe that there is a continuous cycle of life, death and rebirth known as samsara. What is reborn, however, is not your soul because there is a no self. What gets transferred is your consciousness, meaning you may have access to memories of a previous life. This is a very bad thing because they also believe that to exist is to suffer. Mood. So the entire goal is to break free of the samsara. In order to do so, one must reach enlightenment, which is easier said than done and usually requires many lifetimes to achieve, if you are lucky. However, you are not guaranteed to reincarnate as a human every time. In fact, a human birth is considered to be very rare and precious since it allows for a greater chance of attaining enlightenment. You can be reborn as any of the following creatures in their own respective realms. Gods, demigods, humans, animals, hungry ghosts and hell creatures. Your rebirth is determined by the karma that you accumulated during your previous life. Good actions lead to good karma and vice versa. Side note, this may be the inspiration for why René was so adamant that one must not accidentally receive a vision while trying to forsake the self, or in other words, become a no-self. Yes, a vision shackles you to fate, but it can also allow you to ascend to Celestia, and gods not only exist in a different realm from humans, but also aren't as likely to achieve enlightenment, which in his case is the attainment of a stronger will. Just wanted to leave you with some food for thought, carry on. Despite all of this, some enlightened individuals, ascended masters, choose to reincarnate even after breaking free of the samsara, all for the purpose of being guides to those still trapped within this cycle. That's the very basic gist of it, anyway. And now we are finally ready to discuss why I believe these four cycles do not correspond to the number of times Tevat has been remade, but rather are the cycles contained within each loop. Like we just saw, in Buddhist belief, each cycle of the samsara can be wildly different, even going so far as to take place in different realms. However, every time we experience the samsara in game, it consists of a short amount of time that looped endlessly. Every single day of the Sub-Zero's festival samsara was the exact same. Every attempt at fitting Shoki no Kami was the exact same up until the point of divergence, where Nahida kept trying different things to try and achieve a different result. The four cycles described by the Ordo, however, are totally different. A different step of human spiritual evolution is associated with each one, and you cannot progress by doing the exact same thing over and over again. It would make no sense for these cycles to be different loops of the exact same events. The remnants of Rukadvata's consciousness even call Nahida my new self in this samsara, meaning that Rukadvata and Nahida lived in different cycles. But this rebirth happened only 500 years ago. A cycle ended and another began during the Cataclysm. And yet Tevat was not remade and nothing started anew. Not to mention that the four cycles perfectly line up with different phases of Tevat's history as well as with the arrival of the four descenders. We are talking about one continuous timeline here. Don't believe me? Check this out. Hyperborea is the cycle where paradise is lost. Natlantian is the defeat of evil dragons. Ramuria is original sin. The text writes it as original sin and baptism, but I believe that baptism lines up with the first half of the fourth cycle, Cronaria. You will see why in a moment. As for freedom from the gods, this would correspond to the second half of the fourth cycle, which we aren't living in just yet. 
Since all of the cycles are about human evolution, we cannot begin our timeline at the dawn of Tevat. Instead, we need to start counting the time from the moment heavenly principles created humans, 400 years after their arrival, during the time of the first civilization. The description of the root cycle tells us that, during Hyperborea, the world was frozen, which perfectly matches up with what the prayer's artifact set tells us. This unified civilization lived through a period where the world was blanketed in unending ice. But at this time, the gods and their envoys walked among them directly. The heavens saw that their every need was met, and a hundred years of prosperity was promised to them. But the human mind is far too curious for its own good. The creation turned to the creator and questioned eternity. What would happen once the promised time of plenty came to an end? To question eternity was forbidden. But humanity would not stop there. They grew proud and ambitious, leading them to scheme to enter the Garden of the Gods, which greatly angered them. According to Remurian records, the punishment for this offense came in the form of tsunamis and heavy rain, which drowned all sin. Fontaine was hit the hardest and the longest, but this seems to have been a Teyvat wide sentence. Celestia stopped being a provider and became a punisher. They severed their connection to humanity. To lose one's connection to the divine is to lose paradise. This is a reference to the biblical story of Adam and Eve and how they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. In truth, this entire timeline seems to take inspiration from the Christian canon, as you will see. So, I'm proposing that the first cycle, Hyperborea, stretches from the creation of mankind all the way to the war with the second who came. This first cycle represents the descent and rule of the very first descender, Heavenly Principles a being whose will was capable of creating a new world. The second cycle has a very interesting name, Atlantean. It seems like an odd choice to name it after a specific nation, especially one that we still hardly know anything about. But Atlantean is all about defeating evil dragons, and even though the root cycle makes it seem like this is purely metaphorical, Natlan is a nation of war and dragons. While I'm sure there is more to it and that we'll find out more about this cycle in the 4.x patches, perhaps that is all that we need to know for now. Because we have 4 cycles and 4 descenders. Thus, the Atlantean should match up with the arrival of the second descender. And there is a popular theory that suggests that this mysterious individual was none other than Nibelung. And now, more than ever, this makes sense. According to René, one needs to fall into the abyss and be reborn as a holy infant to acquire a will that measures up to that of the senders. Nibelung went to the abyss for the sole purpose of acquiring more power that would allow him to destroy the new order imposed by heavenly principles. Remember, a descender is someone whose will can protect the world, sustain the world, destroy the world, and create the world. Had Nibelung won, he would have destroyed the creations of the Primordial One, humanity included, making him an evil dragon from their perspective. Thus, the second cycle, Atlantean, stretched from the war with the second who came to probably some time before the start of the Archon War, when Remuria was established. The third cycle is known as Remuria, and corresponds to the original sin, which in Genshin's context refers to Ijuria creating new humans, a feat that should be reserved to the celestial gods alone. However, since she would be the ruler of Fontaine, not Remuria, and because she likely lacked the power to turn Oceanids into humans prior to becoming an Archon, this should have happened during the Archon War, when she was gifted a Gnosis. We don't know when the third descender arrived, only that their body was used to make the Gnosis, kickstarting the Archon War. So this third cycle should start sometime before that, namely when Remuria was established, given the name of the cycle. Even though at that point the original sin had not yet been committed, this entire cycle is filled with sin. Because all of Remuria is a giant reference to the biblical deluge. Ten generations after the creation of the first man, Adam, God saw that humanity was corrupt. So he decided to wipe it out with a flood and remake the world through the microcosm of Noah's Ark. In Genshin, this is the punishment that befell humanity for trying to enter the Garden of the Gods. But for some reason, the area that is now present-day Fontaine got hit the hardest. The floods were so frequent that no true civilization emerged for a very long time. That is, until Remus went around in his ship, Fortuna, and created a kingdom out of what once were sinful barbarians. He is literally Noah! And yet, Remuria was prophesied to be destroyed and its people to return to the Primordial Sea. This is really important, keep it in mind. 
And so it was. Remurio was swept into the abyss. The survivors, having had their home destroyed, resorted back to their sinful ways, until Egirio emerged as a new god of Fontaine and showed them mercy. Only to become the greatest sinner of all. So the third cycle, Remuria, begins with the creation of Remuria and corresponds to the arrival of the third descender. But when does it end? Roughly 500 years ago, which is when the Traveler would have arrived in Tevat. The Cataclysm must mark the end of the third cycle and the beginning of the fourth. We know this thanks to Rukhadvada, but also because the Order was conducting their research post-Cataclysm and they believe to already have been living in Kron Arya. And that is precisely why I'm not lumping baptism in with the original sin, all under the umbrella of the third cycle. Because the baptism happened after the cataclysm. In fact, we just saw it taking place. Baptism is a Christian sacrament of initiation, where the newfound Christian is either submerged in water or sprinkled with it. That water washes away all the sins that the person committed up until that point, including original sin. Nouvellette baptized the people of Fontaine. They took a dip in the sea and he forgave their original sin by granting them real blood. So this phase of spiritual evolution has been concluded, which means that we should be moving on to the unnamed second phase of the fourth cycle, the very last cycle that there will ever be according to the world's formula. The phase that will set humanity free from the gods. But this one is weird. How come the Ordo could predict what it would be all about and even that it would lead to the end of the world but couldn't even name it? It might be because this one has never happened before. And yes, René messed up his calculations. He did not take the Traveler into consideration, for one, and he did not foresee that the Narwhal would be defeated. So, crisis averted, right? Tivai the save! Well, not quite. I still believe that we are living through Tevad's last breath. But we will get there in a second. For now, we just discussed how these four cycles refer to a continuous timeline, a single loop of the samsara, if you will. But I also told you that this does not disprove the time loop theory at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. There are a lot of loose threads in the narrative that are best explained by all of it having already taken place, probably many times over. The first one most people point out is Venti's weird voice line. a refreshing sleep? Ah, Traveler, we meet again! What? You don't remember me? <laughs> well, allow me to join you on your quest once again. I must see to it that the bards of the world tell the Traveler's tales. This implies that he had already met the Traveler before, despite them not remembering him. This is made even weirder by all the other characters introducing themselves as though the Traveler were a complete stranger. Venti also claims to know all songs, past and future. Also weird, but perhaps something that can be easily explained away by his connection to Istaroth, the god of time. What cannot be explained away, however, is the fact that the Traveler has knowledge they really shouldn't have and claims things that should be downright impossible. For instance, there is no canon Traveler, and the twin who confronts the sustainer during the opening cutscene is Lumin, regardless of who you pick later. She talks to the sustainer and the god replies. They understand each other, which means they must be speaking the same language. Your chosen traveler also speaks to the sustainer after the twin is trapped, but gets no answer back, so in that case you could argue that they were speaking different languages. However, since Lumin can be chosen as a traveler, that means that the traveler already knew Tevad's language before being sealed. So how exactly did Paimon teach them? I'll do you one better. How did they learn the language in the first place? What we have been told so far is that the Abyss Twin woke up first, spent time in Conria, and then came to wake up the Traveler when the Cataclysm started so that they could escape. The Traveler should have never traveled Tevat prior to meeting Paimon. They didn't have a chance to pick up the language. They also should have never seen Conria. So how come they know something about the Eclipse Dynasty? Something they won't share with even Paimon. Worse yet, the flowers that Lumine wears in her hair are Intevats, a species native to Conria. If Lumine is your traveler, once she meets Dane in a chasm and he explains the meaning behind the flowers, she states that she woke up with those flowers in her hair, so Heater should have placed them there when he came together so that they could flee. If your traveler is Heater, he simply says that those are the flowers that his sister wears. In either case, there is no recognition on the Traveler's part. 
they didn't know the name of the flower or its origins until Dane told them. All they knew was that it had something to do with their twin. But when the Mary Ann in Annapolis asked them what kind of flowers bloom in their home, the place they are from, their answer is the Intivat. So which one is it? Have you been to Conria or have you not? Remember what I said about someone being able to recall memories from their past lives? What if these random memories that don't fit in seamlessly with their journey come from the previous loops where they have already finished traveling this world and seen Conria? The Abyss Twin is aware of the truth of the Vat, so they must know about the Samsara, and if they know that they are stuck in a loop, suddenly them telling the traveler that they have always had enough time makes a lot more sense. And what about Nicole? She is known as the guy that never gets lost, someone who helps others who are in need of guidance. Does it not sound a lot like the Ascended Masters who have escaped the Samsara but choose to be reborn so that they can help others escape the Samsara? This means that Nicole must know that there is a loop. She knows how the story goes and that's why she can tell when it is changed. She is currently helping the Traveler because they have not yet broken free of the Samsara. The second half of the fourth cycle has never happened and humanity has never been set free. All the Descenders changed the world in some way. The first created it as it is, the second nearly destroyed it, the third sustained it and the fourth is meant to recreate it, to change the order that governs it, to reweave fate. The Traveler is fated to ascend, i.e. to break free of the Samsara, so that they may replace the Creator and the Keeper. But that can't have happened before or we would no longer be stuck in a Samsara at all. And this is because the Primordial One is also a reference to Noah and the story of the Flood. Did you remember that thing about Remuria that I asked you to keep in mind? Remus's people were fated to return to the Primordial Sea, but they were not tainted with original sin. They were actual humans created by heavenly principles. They should not have dissolved. Except that the Primordial Sea probably has the ability to dissolve all life once the loop ends. When a cycle ends, the world is made anew. Life is created by and through the Primordial Sea. It is the beginning and the end. During the time of the Celestial Envoys, when life was still new and weak, the waters ran dry as thunder pierced the sky for the first time. This is the water of the Flood, giving way to a new world. Before Sun and Moon is filled with references to the Deluge. The arrival of the Primordial One is labeled when the doves held branches, because that is how Noah knew that the water level had dropped enough for the land masses to resurface. He sent out a dove from the Ark and it came back carrying an olive branch. The year when the Primordial One created humans is known as the year of the Ark's opening, because when Noah opened the Ark, all the humans and animals left to repopulate the Earth. And just like how the Primordial One used their eggshell to separate the microcosm of the world from the rest of the universe, so did God remake the world from the microcosm of Noah's Ark. Heck, even Tivat means Ark! We are living in a perpetual loop where the Primordial Sea rises and resets everything, only for heavenly principles to make it anew. The Keeper is fading away, the Creator has not yet come. Slash is not faring well, Tevat is at its end. It's nearing the end of this loop of the Samsara, it's fading. But the creator will come back once everything is reset. Except they won't. The Ordo predicted this would be the very last cycle because the Narwhal drank up the Primordial Sea. It did not get a chance to consume all of it, we have been to the Primordial Sea after it was defeated and it's still there. But we will probably see the Narwhal again, and at any rate, there is a chance that there isn't enough left to reset the world. So once the bat fades, it will be gone for good. There are too many unaccounted for variables currently at play for me to believe everything will just reset as usual. Especially because, from a storytelling perspective, it wouldn't make sense to send us back to the beginning. It is up to the Traveler to break free of the Samsara, recreate the world with their will and, in the process, break humanity free from their fate, from the gods. The story of the Narcissan Cross Ordo is all about being stuck in the past and waking up from a dream into another dream, all the while refusing to face reality, refusing the truth. And just like the Traveler told Mary Ann in Anapauses, even if the truth isn't that important, 
the future is. And there can be no future if the loop isn't broken. This is the true purpose of the traveler's journey. But one question remains. If everything is just perpetually looping, exactly as it did many, many times before, why does Celestia bother? Doing the exact same thing while expecting different results is the definition of insanity after all. What do they get out of this? This is where I need to thank JK Crafted. Seriously, you are the best. I do not know anything about one of these games and very little about the other, so according to the information he so kindly provided, the concept of Samsara is not limited to Genshin. In fact, it has been brought up in a similar fashion in two other games within the Honkai-verse, Honkai Impact 3rd and Guns Girl Z. In both of these games, there are Hershers, which in most cases the Archons in Genshin end up resembling. And just like the Archons, the Hershers also have authorities. One of these is the authority of finality, which can be used to manipulate Honkai energy in order to do literally anything, including create some Saras that also loop. However, this authority has an ability called World Correction, which allows it to essentially do backups of the data of the world and edit said data. So whoever is utilizing this authority can decide to remove specific parts of the world or universe for the next loop, or to go back to the original setting, so to speak. But there is a catch. World correction cannot override the natural order or rules of a world, so their users can simply decide exactly what the outcome they want is and make it happen. Instead, it may require some trial and error, which forces them to loop the samsara multiple times. In Genshin, we know that Heavenly Principles has never been able to subdue Tevad's natural order completely and that they have been struggling with it this whole time. Meanwhile, the one thing that Celestia really can stand is human abrogation. First, those pesky little humans scheme to enter the Garden of the Gods. Then, they turn to the Abyss and rise up against Celestia. And now, they are running around rambling about spiritual evolution and breaking free of divinity. None of that sounds like something Heavenly Principles would be okay with. But if they have control over fate and are able to loop the Samsara, they should just be able to quench that rebellion, right? But the natural order of this world does not allow them to do it. Teyvad has its own unique rules, after all. So, all of the hypothetical loops we've already been through are a perfect example of the trial and error needed to achieve one's desired outcome. This would perfectly explain the purpose of Ermensol. It records the history of the world and edits it in real time when information is removed or added, so that would allow the gods to make changes in the future loops. Ermensol behaves a whole lot like the authority of finality. But there is also another possibility. In Honkai Impact 3rd, there is also some Samsara that takes place in an isolated world, a bubble world. There, a powerful entity rules over everything to ensure that this world strives, before inevitably bringing about its own destruction. When that happens, Honkai energy is released, which this being uses to become more powerful. Then they hit the reset button and the Samsara restarts so that they can farm the same world again and again. Now, in Genshin, we have never seen the Honkai manifest in the same way they do in these two games. The closest thing to it would probably be Abyssal Energy. However, there is a character in Honkai Impact that scanned the multiverse looking for a world that was free of the Honkai, and they came to the conclusion that such a world did not exist. And yes, they were aware of Tevat because they saw Dvalin. That means that Tevat cannot be an exception to the rule. If it were to be destroyed, it would also release Honkai energy, which Heavenly Principles is probably in dire need of. They haven't been in great shape ever since the war with the second who came, and if they really always end up in such a weakened state by the end of each loop of the Samsara, farming this energy might be the solution. Tevat might just be one huge battery. But if Heavenly Principles is in such a sorry state, would they really be able to restart the Samsara? Perhaps not but thankfully they have someone to help them out. The Sustainer of Heavenly Principles, like the name suggests, sustains Heavenly Principles. And she is also remarkably similar to Kiana Kuzlana as the Hersher of the Void. And it just so happens that all of the Hershers of Finality we have seen have been some version of Kiana Kuzlana. So if someone would be able to use Ermensel, which acts a lot like the Authority of Finality, would it not be someone who resembles the Harsher of Finality as much as the Sustainer does? Or, at the very least, that's what I got from all of this. Can you tell that I finally caught up to the Artisan Cross Quests? 
I'm just mad it took me this long because that was some juicy lore. So much so in fact that you can expect the next video to also be about it. So what do you think? Do you have a different interpretation of the Samsara or of Slash's role? What do you think the second half of the fourth cycle will be like? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you've made it this far, you are the GOAT. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing and sharing the video. I'm Blue and I'll see you again soon with more delusional ramblings. Safe journey, travelers!